The Stallholder's Story In the middle of the 16th century, Peter Bruegel the Elder painted a picture of the crucifixion. The choices he made in depicting the procession to Calvary and the scene on Golgotha will probably surprise you if you don't already know the painting. The crucifixion is shown in the far background of the painting, which is teeming with life, activity and people, going on with the business of everyday life, utterly unaware of the political execution happening in their midst and its religious significance. Bruegel's painting is both realistic and an accusation. Why would yet another regular piece of Roman rough justice have all the attention of the people in Jerusalem that spring festival day? If you're not directly involved, don't be directly concerned. That's true of human nature in the first century, the 16th century, and today. These series of meditations try to imagine what that might have been like for people who were on the fringes of significant events that first Holy Week, and yet who didn't realise it. People for whom life was all about where the next piece of safety and security might come from and who weren't concerned with the monumental political and religious events happening in their midst. Such an attitude is, understandably, still with us today. In Bruegel's painting, everyone is wearing contemporary dress, and Jerusalem looks like a prosperous town in early modern Flanders. Do we ourselves still stand uncomprehendingly on the sidelines of events that change the world? In the words of the prophet Jeremiah, Is it nothing to you? all ye that pass by. How are we, like the people of the city and countryside of Jerusalem, witnesses to the Passover?
It's complicated. I know it's complicated. What's more, I know that it's deliberately complicated. It's complicated because it's important. All important things in life are. It can be simple or it can be true. Worshipping the Lord in his temple has to be complicated because it's so important. You're not buying a basket of fish here. You're not weighing a bushel of grapes. This is the peace and salvation of the nation we're talking about. This is your chance to find your way through shale. After all, you know how important the temple is. The one true and living God agreed to dwell here among his people. The God who made the heavens, whose throne is above the seven heavens far away, allowed us to make him a dwelling place, first of goatskin in a tent, and then of finely dressed stones. None of this comes cheap in money or time or trouble or the consciences of men and women. This is God we're talking about. It has to be hard. That shows it's true. But it doesn't have to be impossible. The temple needs to be financially supported, and the easiest and most convenient way of doing that is in coin. And there's the first problem. All the coins of Greece or Rome are covered with pagan inscriptions to their own gods. Do you want to offer the one true God something that contradicts his very being? No, of course you don't. That's why the temple tax has to be paid with coins from Tyre, the only coinage from around the great sea that doesn't mention the demon gods of the pagans. And let's not get too picky about the eagle on the back of the coin. But not everyone has access to Tyrian coins. So that's why my brother Bartholomew and his colleagues are here. They'll change your everyday pagan money into coins that are acceptable to the living God and his representatives. Simple. Bring us your unclean money and we'll give you clean money in return. Like bathing in the waters of the Jordan. Same with the sacrifices. What makes more sense? Carry the poor dove or the pair of pigeons all the way from Galilee, a lamb on your shoulders all the way from Tarsus, only to get here and find they've been spoilt on the journey. Unblemished is the standard required, and that's hard to maintain if you're avoiding bandits in Samaria. So come to my cousin Thaddeus's stall, and he'll make sure that you get acceptable sacrifices, guaranteed, regularly inspected by the priests, and pre-approved for approval by the Lord. And if his animals are slightly more expensive than you might pay at home, think of all the money you've saved in forage on that tedious three-week journey up to Jerusalem, let alone the time, effort and paperwork. I know there are some who say that the wrong people are running the temple, mostly those nutters in caves down by the Dead Sea. And I know that some people say the temple isn't necessary and that studying the scriptures can give you the same result. But honestly, tell me truthfully, when was the last time you felt as good and alive and whole and forgiven as you did standing in the court of Israel before the altar of the Lord? I bet it wasn't ever in your local synagogue, listening to the rabbi mumbling through the scroll of Chronicles. So, the temple is important and the temple is necessary, which makes us a target of all those who think they should be in charge, they should be the ones making the decisions about and the profits from the temple's worship. Every couple of years there's a demo of some kind, a piece of political theatre, or, if it's a bit more serious, a bit of political suicide. Annoy the temple authorities too much, annoy the Romans too much, and you're disappeared. Protesters have come and gone. The stones of the temple are still here, and always will be. Which is why I wasn't too worried about the latest protester, the carpenter rabbi down from some dreadful place in the north. I heard that he had marched into the city yesterday at the head of a ragtag group of tourists, proclaiming his importance in some way. We expected him to show up and cause a scene then, but apparently he came into the outer courts, took a shufti and pushed off. The temple often has that effect on people. It's the biggest and most impressive building anyone has ever seen in their life, especially if you're a provincial. Anyway, he seems to have spent the last night getting some of the courage of Nabal, if you know what I mean, drinking, being merry, because he tipped up this morning in a filthy mood. The hangover of the righteous, I reckon. He came storming into the court of the Gentiles, where most of the facilitators have set up their stalls, and started turning over tables and smashing jars and cages and the bowls of money, clean and unclean. Thieves! Bandits! Brigands! he was shouting, not making much more sense than that. Until all the vigour seemed to disappear from him like dew in the sun, and he stopped in front of a group of priests who'd been there all along. 
they played it cool. A blinder, I would say. It would have been so easy to reach for swords and the temple police at that point, but we had no idea if the mob who were calling for him to rule Israel yesterday were today outside the precincts with cudgels and knives. A bloodbath in the temple is never a good idea, especially not the week before a high day. So, coolly, as I say, they ask him what on earth he thinks he's doing. Then, and this is the weird thing, The hot-headed revolutionary turns into the mildest philosopher and he starts bandying scriptural references as if he's been teaching and studying in the temple colonnade all his life, like a Jewish symposium. Jeremiah and Habakkuk get quoted, but not the gentle, comforting bits of Jeremiah. Rather, death, destruction, and all of it deserved, promised against those who thought themselves to be loved by God and have let him down. And I can see the priests are actually enjoying this. Even if this is a man who has disrupted the smooth running of the temple, at least he cares. At least he thinks what goes on here is more important than form and custom and doing what you've always done since Methuselah was a lad. And this conversation is going on while the stallholders are running around chasing doves and stamping on the swift hands of opportunists, trying to pick up the fallen coins and get themselves a better rate of exchange. It's the strangest rabbinic debate I've ever seen. But it doesn't end in agreement. The carpenter is getting more emphatic as he lectures the priests, and some fingers start wagging back in his face. To be honest, I don't blame the priests. How could they not get annoyed when they're lectured like this? None of this is worthy of the one who is holy and on high. None of this depends on the kings, the priests, the scribes. You are responsible for the building, a responsibility which you've neglected and exploited. You're not responsible for the presence of the Holy One, and you're certainly not responsible for the forgiveness which comes from the love and presence of the Holy One. At this, the carpenter turns towards the crowds and stallholders who've restored some order and who realise that the entertainment is continuing. If you think you're buying God's favour, then you're a fool and greatly to be pitied. If you think that it makes one piece of difference whether you pay your temple tax with the approved coins and then go home to defraud your neighbour and exploit your servants and ravish your daughters, then get away from me. For the father of lies is your friend and Beelzebub is your God and you are destined for the pit. But... If you seek to do good, love mercy, practice justice, and allow the Holy of Holies to be in your words and actions and your heart, then God will welcome you, even without the doves of sacrifice. Hear him, hear him, shout his disciples, and some in the crowd even join in with a few ragged but heartfelt hosannas. Do you hear what the crowd are saying? Our Saka, the senior priest there. Yes, I hear them, the carpenter replies. And so does Jeremiah, who prophesied that this would be a place of prayer for all peoples. And so does the Lord on high, who welcomes the words and wisdom of the babes and sucklings. And he turns back to the crowd. If you have sinned, you will be forgiven. If you have been impure, you will be purified. But not through any process of profit and corruption. Trust in me and come to me, for I am the peace offering that is pleasing to the Lord." There was a gasp at that. He was saying that he was in the place of the temple. He was the way God brought us to himself. The crowd went quiet, and some began to back away, and his disciples muscled their way to the front of the crowd to get him down from the steps on which he stood. But before they could carry him off, the carpenter leant into the priests and almost whispering said, It's my father's house. He'll require an account from his servants. Be ready to give one. At that, they were gone, melting into the crowd who didn't want to be associated with them. I saw Sakar shake his head at one of the temple guards standing by the gate into the court of the Gentiles. He waved his hand, palm down at him. Nothing was going to be done today. There had already been too much of a disturbance. But the cheek of a man who can come into the holy places of Israel and behave as if he could tell us what was justice and what was mercy and what worship the Lord God Almighty requires of us. Surely this is the worst of Israel, when some carpenter from Nazareth can stand in the courts of the temple and boast about his own zeal. What must God think of him? Anyway, must check my accounts. I'm sure I saw one of the disciples sniffing around my money bags. <laughs>